Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Leo Grork. I need to say from Trent University. That's Trento without the O. Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Christian Dahlman. He is full professor of jurisprudence and philosophy of law at the University of Lund in Sweden. His main area of research is philosophy of law. He is heading a research group on legal argumentation at Lund. Currently, he is pursuing a project on ad hominem arguments. It makes me wonder if that means ad hominem arguments are all right to use today, but we will see. He is a member of the executive committee in the International Association for Philosophy of Law and Social Philosophy. And today he's going to speak on unacceptable generalizations in arguments on legal evidence. So we'll have about 45 minutes for the presentation and then about half an hour for discussion. Christian Lund. Okay, here, please tell when you want. Okay, no, but I can just okay, manage you. myself, okay? Okay, um, I don't think I need to use the microphone. Yes, you do. You know, really? We got to be recording. You're recording? He knows, yes. So okay. It would be better to use the microphone. But you should use that. Okay, okay, then I'll use it because... Okay, so is this good? Uh, well, first of all, Warm thanks for this very generous invitation to come to this beautiful city. This is my first time here. I envy all of you who live here all your lives in this beautiful city. Uh, warm thanks to Professor Mancin, Professor Pupo, for, for organizing this uh, very interesting event. Um, as you heard, uh, I'm um, from Lund University in the south of Sweden. I'm uh, directing a research group there called LEVIC, uh, Law, Evidence and Cognition, which is a cross-disciplinary research group composed of lawyers, philosophers and cognitive psychologists. And we are looking at various issues dealing with argumentation relating to, to legal evidence, among other things, ad hominem arguments, but, but not exclusively. So. Um, the title of my talk today is Unacceptable Generalizations in Arguments on Legal Evidence. Uh, and basically, uh, all arguments on legal evidence rely on generalizations. It's something that Anderson Schumann Twining showed uh, in their uh, seminal work, Analysis of Evidence. Uh, so, generalizations are very important for argumentation on legal evidence. You could say, basically, that in arguments on legal evidence, where you point to a certain evidence and you claim that that evidence somehow supports a certain hypothesis, for example, the defendant is guilty, it is always, in one way or the other, the connection, the thing that links the facts to the hypothesis, always somehow relies on various kinds of generalizations. So the claim that uh, because of this evidence, because of this fact, it is now more probable that the hypothesis is true, that the defendant is guilty, uh, the justification for that claim uh, always entails generalizations of one kind or another. So therefore. They are very important. I'm not going to go into that because what I'm interested in, what I'm going to talk about today, are uh, uh, unacceptable generalizations. Basically the idea that some generalizations are quite trivial and uncontroversial and maybe we don't even think about them as generalizations. Maybe we don't even think of them as assumptions because they are so uncontroversial. But there are generalizations that are deeply problematic and 
some even unacceptable. So I'm going to start with some examples. I'm going to start with an example of what I believe to be an unproblematic uh, generalization in an argument of legal evidence. So I'm, uh, I'm going to use five cases here in my talk. This is the first case. I'm calling it the blue car. So in this case here, uh, we have a witness, an eyewitness, who testifies that he saw a blue car in a certain alley. This is the crime scene where a burglary took place. And the defendant has a blue car. So this is one of, of, of the ev existing evidences against the defendant that this was actually his car parked outside the warehouse where this burglary was committed. Uh, now, the thing is that as this took place at night, the defense attorney questions this testimony and says, well, you know, when it's dark, it's really, really difficult to distinguish colors. I mean, we all know this, that some, sometimes in the dark, some, an object that is actually green can be perceived, mistakenly perceived as blue, for example. So, because of the fact that it was dark in this alley, the probability that the witness is mistaken in saying that the car was blue is higher than it normally would be. So, this is an example of an argument now linking the evidence it was dark to the hypothesis that it, the testimony could be incorrect based on the generalizations that colors are difficult to distinguish in the dark. Uh, so, if one would make now a case why this is an, a true and acceptable generalization, it could go something like this. Okay, we have here the evidence E, observation in the dark, and the hypothesis incorrect testimony. And what it's all about is the relation between two classes. We have here, when we say that a certain piece of, of, of evidence is pertaining, what we say is that the case at hand belongs to the class of cases where this is the fact. So if we're, if we're in a case where, where the op the, um, the testimony was made in the dark. No, this, so this testimony belongs to the class of cases, testimonies uh, where the observations would, were made in the dark. So this is what I would call the reference class. And the idea of the argument is, of course, to say that because the case at hand, our testimony, belongs to a certain reference class, that makes it more probable that it also belongs to another class, the target class of cases where the hypothesis is true. And one can imagine, for example, someone trying to, to prove uh, that this is the case with, with the argument we're just looking at, would say that, well, for example, let's say that we have a hundred cases. Uh, there's an error, this should say 79, not 89. Uh, I, let's say that we have a hundred cases. And 20 of those, in 20 of those cases, they're all cases with an eyewitness observing a car in an alley and testifying about the color of the car. So let's say that in 20 of those cases, uh, it was dark. And in 80 cases, one plus 79, uh, the light was good. Let us suppose also that out of these 100 cases, in 95 cases, the testimony was correct. The color of the car was actually the color that uh, the, the witness reported. But in five cases, the target class, the witness is mistaken about the color. And let us assume here that these are distributed so that 
if you, if you look at the 20 cases where it was dark, there are 16 correct and four incorrect observations. Whereas if we look at the cases where the light was good, it's 79 versus one. Now, if this is what the world is like, someone could make the following argument. Well, the fact that this particular observation was made in the dark increases the probability that it's incorrect. Because before we knew whether it was made in good light or bad light, the probability that it was incorrect is 5%, because we, don't, we have no information about the light. But now, when we know that it was actually dark, we know that four out of 20 cases, 20% 20 of observations in the dark are actually incorrect. So that means that the probability increases from five to 20% that the observation is incorrect. And that would be the argument for why the fact that evidence here, observation in the dark, supports the hypothesis that it was incorrect, but because it increases the probability. Now, um, as I said, my idea here is that there are, in legal argumentation out there, cases where lawyers make arguments using generalizations that are acceptable to us, and there are situations with unacceptable generalizations. And uh, I'm going to look at some problematic cases here of, of generalizations. So I have some other examples that are less trivial than the blue car. Here's case number two. I'm calling this case the alibi. So what's happening here is that this guy on the left, he is the defendant in a burglary trial. And the defense calls this woman on the right as an alibi witness. She takes the stand and she testifies that at the time of the burglary, he was actually at her house watching TV. So it couldn't have been him. Now the problem is that she's his mother. So the prosecutor now makes the following argument. Well, we all know mothers, you know. A mother would do anything to protect her son. They would lie, they would even lie in court to protect their son. So, I mean, if this had been someone else, this would have been uh, a pretty good reason to acquit him. But since it's the mother, the probability that she's actually lying is pretty high. Now, this makes use of a, of a generalization that's more problematic than the one we saw before. The fact that colors are difficult to distinguish in the dark is something trivial, we all know it, it's been demonstrated in science. Whether mothers are prepared to lie in court to protect their sons, well, intuitively, well, yeah, probably it could be true, but we, there's really no data and it's rather speculative, so it's more problematic than the generalization from the first case. Here's the third case. I'm calling this a woman, a man, and a gun. In this case, this man on the right here is standing trial for murder. According to the prosecutor, he shot his neighbor with a a gun that he had in a, in a closet in, in his bedroom. And the prosecutor calls this woman on the left as his main witness. That's his wife. And she testifies that he shot the neighbor with the shotgun. No. In this case, the relationship is, is maybe not as good as in the last case, because he claims that he's innocent. He claims that she shot the neighbor with the gun. 
that it wasn't him. So they're blaming each other. These are inspired by real cases, by the way. But, uh, and so, and the forensic evidence is inconclusive because they, there are fingerprint matches from both of them on the gun. But he is the one on trial. So now the prosecutor makes the following argument. Well, let's look at crime statistics. Crime statistics say that if you look at hom homicide with a handgun, less than 10% of those crimes are committed by women. Only about 7 or 8% of people convicted in Sweden, I don't know what the statistic is in Italy, for, for murder uh, are women. So, says the prosecutor, even though this, of course, does not mean that it's necessarily, that he is necessarily guilty, it does increase the probability that it was the, the husband rather than the wife who shot the neighbor. Hmm. That's a problematic generalization. Here's another one for you. Even more provocative. This is a young man from Somalia. He's being prosecuted for uh, shoplifting. And similarly to the previous case, the prosecutor also presents crime statistics showing that if we look at people convicted for shoplifting, People of Somali origin are 15 times more probable, more often, more frequently convicted of shoplifting than people from other ethnicities. And of course the prosecutor says that, okay, this does not prove by itself that the defendant is guilty, but it does increase the probability that he is guilty. And this is the last case. Uh, a case of uh, drug dealing where the defendant has prior convictions for the same offense. He has twice before been convicted for drug dealing. So now he's on trial again and the prosecutor makes the argument that, well, you know, the fact that he is actually convicted for this crime before uh, well, it doesn't prove that he's guilty, but it does show that he has some kind of propensity in this direction. It does in make it more probable than otherwise that he is guilty. So these are the examples that I'm going to use. My argument today will be the following. There are many kinds of generalizations that are unacceptable in legal argumentation. Uh, but they're not necessarily unacceptable for the same reason. There are different grounds for why we would say that a certain argument is unacceptable. And there are at least four different grounds. I will call them false generalizations, non-robust generalizations, bias-triggering generalizations, and discriminating generalizations. There might be others as well, but there, these are at least four different reasons for saying that a certain generalization is unacceptable in an argument on legal evidence. And I think it's important to distinguish these from each other because it seems to me that in the general debate on this, these often get confused with each other. And there's also another distinction which I think is important, which also gets confused. And that is when a certain cl a claim that a generalization is unacceptable uh, could actually be of two different kinds. Sometimes when we say that a generalization is unacceptable, we mean that it's unacceptable categorically. What we mean is that this kind of evidence, the fact that the case belongs to this reference class, should never be used to support this particular hypothesis. 
For example, if we take the last case with the ex-convict, someone would say that prior conviction for the same offense should never be used as an argument for guilt in the present case. And there are, are actually some legal systems that have this kind of rule. For example, the, uh, uh, the US system, the Federal Rules of Evidence, have a rule of this, exactly this kind. I don't know if the Canadian has, but maybe so. Uh, this must be distinguished from cases where we say that a certain generalization is unacceptable, but not categorically, where we say that well, this way in this particular argument, the way that the, this fact is supposedly used to support a certain hypothesis is not acceptable. For, for example, because it exagger it's exaggerated. For instance, if someone would say, well, the fact that he's been previously convicted for the same offense, uh, that usually increases the probability that he's guilty. You can, against such an argument, you can imagine two different objections. One would be to say, you should never use prior conviction as arguments for guilt, or you say, well, it's okay to use it, but in this particular case, you are exaggerating the evidentiary value of it, because it, it might slightly increase the probability, but it's not hugely increasing it. I will get back to these later. Um, Let's look at the first one, false generalizations. So, as you saw before with my example with the, um, with the observations in the dark, the idea here is that if the generalization supports the conclusion, the hypothesis, you have a situation where the probability of the hypothesis, given the evidence, so one here, is higher than the probability of the hypothesis when we do not have information of whether E is the case or not. So it simply says, okay, the evidence increases the probability of the hypothesis. For that to be the case, it must necessarily be so that membership in the target class is more common in the reference class than among cases in general. This, this is very important. And it's important to remember that it's not enough that membership in the target class is common in the reference class. It must be more common than among cases in general. Which was the case with my previous example uh, with the blue cars. In that case, uh, incorrect observations uh, were more frequent in the reference class, 20%, than in cases in general, 5%. Now, here is an example of what it could look like when that is not the case. I'm using here uh, this, the fifth example, prior conviction for the same offense and, and guilt. Now, let us assume here that we have a 100 people on trial. And 60 of those have been previously convicted for the same offense. 40 have not. And let us assume also that 70% are guilty. That's the target class. And 30% are innocent. Now suppose that someone would say, okay, Let's look at a particular case here. And oh, in this case, the defendant has a prior conviction for the same offense. Well, how does that affect the probability that he's guilty? If someone in this case would make the generalization that the prosecutor made in my previous example, that that makes it more probable that he's guilty, that would be an incorrect argument. Because look here, the probability that the defendant is guilty before we know whether he has a previous conviction, is 70%, right? Whereas the probability that he is guilty after we receive the information that he has a prior conviction for the same offense is 
40 divided by 60. 67% approximately. So that means that if this is what the world looks like, the information that the defendant has a pr previous conviction for the same offense does not make it more probable that he's guilty, it actually makes it less probable that he's guilty. The probability goes from 70% to 67%. So this would be a case of a false generalization. A case where it's not so that membership in the target class is more common in the reference class than the cases in general. It is common. This is important. Most people with a prior conviction are guilty, but it's not more common to be guilty in the reference class than in cases in general. And that's why membership in the reference class does not make it more probable that the defendant is guilty. Um, whether the world really looks like this, I will get back to in a minute. But this is the basic analysis of why, when a generalization is false. So let's then look at the five cases and ask the question that we need to put to all these five cases and see if, if it's the following propositions are true. If they are true, they are true generalizations. Uh, if, if, if the proposition is false, then it's a false generalization. So the first case, the blue car case. The crucial proposition is the following. Observations where a green car is mistakenly perceived as blue are more common among observations that are made in the dark than among observations in general. True or false? Yeah, as we said, this is true. So check, that's a true generalization. Case two, uh, this is the, the alibi case. Testimonies that provide a false alibi are more common among testimonies given by the defendant's mother than among testimonies in general. Is this true? I think that it's probably true. I mean, it's, I don't really have data for this, but I wouldn't, at least I wouldn't say that it's false. I mean, we don't have any reason to think that it's false. Uh, I think there is reason to be careful with this generalization, but it's not in any way blatantly false. Number three, in murder cases, so this is the woman, the man, and the gun case, guilty defendants are more common among male defendants. Hmm, is this true? Maybe, probably. An important thing here to remember is just because more men are convicted of murder doesn't mean that among people who are defendants for murder that, that, more, that men are more often guilty. Might not be, it's not the same thing. Uh, the, um, case, the shoplifting case. In shoplifting cases, guilty defendants are more common among defendants of Somali origin than among defendants in general. Well, again, we have the same problem. They are more oftenly convicted. That doesn't mean that among defendants that they're more oftenly guilty. It could also be the case that courts uh, have a prejudice towards people from Somalia. Uh, and the last case here, uh, the ex-convict ex case, Guilty defendants are more common among defendants who have been previously convicted for the same offense than among defendants in general. Well, in my example, this was false. And as some of you know, I've argued in a, in a previous study that it is actually false in the real world. <coughs> it is actually so that prior conviction for the same offense does not make it more probable that the defendant is guilty, but makes it less probable. And this, this sounds counterintuitive, but the reason for this is that if you look at empirical studies 
on wrongful prosecution and wrongful convictions, a lot of studies like this in the US, and you look at people, there are more than 200 people in the US who have been exonerated on DNA evidence who have been previously convicted for crimes they didn't commit. And if you look at why these people were wrongfully convicted, the number one reason is the following. The number one cause for wrongful conviction is the following. The police used people who had been previously convicted for the same offense as possible subjects, as suspects. They showed photos of these people to an eyewitness who mistakenly identified one of these people uh, as guilty of the present case, uh, a person who was actually innocent. And based on this eyewitness testimony, that person was later convicted. So there is a strong connection between being previously convicted for a crime and being wrongfully prosecuted. Uh, I would say that people like us who have, do not have previous convictions, it's very unlikely that one of us would find ourselves in the terrible situations of being suspects of a crime we didn't commit. That's very unlikely. It could happen, but it's very unlikely. But if we were a group of ex-convicts, that would not be unlikely at all. So what I showed in that study is that it's probably the case that if we look at innocent defendants in that group, people with a prior conviction for the same offense are overrepresented in that group. And for that reason, prior conviction does not make it more probable, but less probable that someone is guilty. Um, so out of the five here, the one that I would say is a where there is data to support that it's a false generalization, is A5, the last argument. It might be that A3 and A4 are false as well, uh, but I don't really have any data to support that. So, that was false generalizations. Now I'm coming to something different a different reason for saying that a generalization is unacceptable. Non-robust generalizations. Imagine that someone would say something like this. Well, wait a minute. What's all this use of generalizations in criminal cases? I mean, we are not making judgments on groups in general. We are making a judgment on a particular case. It's this guy here, this defendant, that we are trying. Not men in general, or Somali people in general, or whoever. Wouldn't the fair and epistemically correct thing be to say that every defendant should be judged on his or her individual merits only, and never be judged on the basis of belonging to a certain reference class? This argument is called uh, particularism. This, the, the argument sounds uh, intuitively sympathetic, but actually it's impossible, it's an impossible argument. The idea that we could get rid of generalizations completely and only judge cases by their individual properties is impossible. <coughs> this has been demonstrated by several scholars, uh, Fred Schauer, Peter Tillers, other people. Basically, what's happening, what we can do is to say we won't use this generalization, but what we will do is substitute it for another generalization. Suppose, for example, that in the case of uh, the woman, the man, and the gun, that the 
defendant, the defense attorney would say something like this. Well, even though men as a group are more violent than women as a group and commit more murders, <coughs> you have to judge this particular defendant. And he's not a violent man. He is a very friendly and benign. He would never hurt a fly. And I actually have evidence to prove this. I mean, we can look at his record. We can have character testimonies that he's never been in a fight in his whole life, etc., etc. Now, this is uh, an, might be an appealing argument, even a good argument, but it, it's important to notice that it's not getting rid of generalizations completely. It's just substituting one reference class for another. It's substituting the reference class men in general for the reference class men who have never been in a fight, uh, have a track record of, of never being violent, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but, but there is still, there is something to this argument that, there, that it's problematic to judge someone just because he happens to be a man, just because other men, men as a group, have, have certain characteristics. Um, and I think that the correct answer to this, the correct approach to this problem is to say, no, it's not that we can do away with generalizations completely, but what we can do and should do is that we should not use generalizations that are non-robust. We should not use generalizations where the reference class is so heterogeneous, where members of this class are very different, so that additional information about a member has a great potential of completely changing the probability of the hypothesis. Non-robustness means that it's the probability that if we would specify the reference class from just men to uh, men who have never been in a fight, when we would add additional information, the probability that that would change the situation is very high. Non-robust means means that it's uh, it's the the reference class is non the the argument is non uh, is non not resistant to new information and new and specification. So I think this would be the argument said when we're dealing with a generalization that is not robust, where we say that if we knew more it's highly likely that the, the, the picture would change, then it's not okay to not look for more information. Then that situation, it's not okay to just go on with the, okay. Um, uh, with the generalization. Uh, but we should get more information, we should specify. This, um, in philosophy, this is called the reference class uh, problem and there's been a lot of discussions on this, uh, but I will move on. Now the third case, a different ground, is to say that some generalizations are problematic for a completely different reason. That is because they trigger bias. So the argument here is that the problem is that the decision, the decision maker, the judge, uh, or the jury, is not able to handle the generalization correctly, but will exaggerate the value of the evidence. So if this is where we are before they get the information, they should, if they get the information that uh, the person has a previous conviction for the same offense or is Somali origin or whatever, that should get us here, but actually because people are prejudiced, the decision maker will end up over here. And this is a dilemma here because we, we this would be the correct spot, but we will we'll never arrive in the correct spot. We have two options. One is to say, okay, you can use this generalization and then they will, the decision maker will end up here. Or say, no, it's not, it's not, you cannot use it, it's inadmissible, and then they will end up here. So we have to choose between two incorrect 
assessments of the probability. And there is actually a uh, US rule in the Federal Rules of Evidence for cases like this, saying that if the judge has reasons to believe that the jury would so much exaggerate uh, the evidentiary value of certain evidence uh, so that they would get it more wrong than right, so to speak, then the judge can say that that evidence is inadmissible. And that would be a different reason for saying that an evidence is unacceptable. That the prejudicial effect is higher than the actual probative value of the evidence. So now I'm on my last, on my list here of different scouts. Now, um, suppose someone would say now here, but wait a minute. I mean, suppose that the Somali case, for example, Suppose it is a true generalization. We cannot prove that it's false. And we can say that it's non-robust because people of Somali origin are a heterogeneous reference class. So we could say that it should be specified. We should get to know more about this guy from Somalia. We should specify. It should not only be guy from Somalia. It should be of Somali origin with a track record of something. An objection to that would say, well, no, that's not enough, because it's not enough to just specify to get more information. There is something fundamentally wrong with using Somali origin in the first place as evidence, even though it's true. So there could be cases where someone would say, you should never use this fact to support a certain hypothesis, even though it actually is a true genocide. It does make it more probable that he's guilty but you should still categorically non-use it. And the argument is not that judges will exaggerate it so it's bias triggering, but that it's discriminating, which is a different ground. The argument here would be to say that it would be unacceptable to use this generalization because the effect that it would have on people of Somali origin, the cumulative effect on their life situation, would be that it would put them in a disadvantage which is, from an ethical point of view, not an epistemic point of view, but from an ethical point of view, unacceptable. So this is a moral argument why certain generalizations should not be allowed. And someone can, of course, say, but wait a minute, I mean, why is this discrimination? Are we not discriminating mothers when we say that uh, when they give alibi, they're not as trustworthy as other people? Are, are, are we not discriminating all the time when we use generalizations? Well, the response would be, yes, we do, but some, some discriminations are acceptable and some are unacceptable. And cases where the people who belong to the reference class are put in a situation where they are put at a substantial disadvantage to the rest of us in their, in their lives, uh, that is ethically unacceptable. That is an unacceptable generalization because it discriminates in an ethically unacceptable way. And the key thing here, of course, is cumulative effect. Why is it that some discriminations have a greater cumulative effect than others? This is my last slide, so I'm just finishing this and then I'm, I'm through. Uh, well, it has to do with applicability and availability. Some generalizations have a greater negative effect on the people in the reference class because they are applicable to more situations than others. For instance, the idea that people of Somali origin are uh, uh, different in character than, than other people is applicable in a lot of contexts. And it's also highly available because the feature, if it's, it's, if it's ethnicity, if it's skin color, it's obvious to, any, to everyone, so everyone can use it all the time. And you don't need to search for additional information to use it. And it's also available in a cognitive sense. As recent studies on, 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 on cognition show that if a certain generalization is 
very deeply rooted in the culture of the decision maker, that generalization will be very available, easily available, in all kinds of situations, in the sense that it will come to mind all the time. And we all know that gender stereotypes or ethnic stereotypes are of this kind. We, they all come to mind all the time. Whereas other kinds of generalizations like uh, that mothers may, may lie to protect their, their children may be not that deeply rooted in our culture. And therefore that the negative effect of those stereotypes, the cumulative effect, is not nearly as great as with, with the unacceptable ones. So I think my time is up and therefore I thank you for your attention. Thank you for that stimulating discussion and they're really fascinating examples. Uh, I'm going to say uh, we have about 25 minutes for comments and uh, questions. Uh, uh, Professor Manzin. First of all, thank you, Christian, for a very, very interesting presentation. And I think it should be also very useful for lawyers and especially for penal lawyers. <laughs> and just uh, a couple of questions to better understand your position. And the first one is, what is the ground for a generalization? How can, how can I generalize something? For instance, thanks to the statistics, then to, to the existence of commonplaces, of prejudice, the ground, yeah. And the second one is related to the first. It, what's the method to obtain a, a generalization? By induction, by abduction, only this, thank you. Uh, well, I think this is, well, this is a classical question of, of epistemology, I mean, how we derive generalizations. And, uh, I mean, there is a lot of discussion on that. I mean, there are a lot of different, uh, I think that's a little uh, too big subject I didn't want to address today, but uh, I mean, uh, the idea is, of course, that, I mean, you have, I would personally say that we have hypotheses about generalizations and then we test them and if, if the observations uh, fit the hypothesis, then they corrob corroborate the, the uh, uh, the generalizations, otherwise uh, they would be not falsified, but be reasons to be careful. And, uh, but I mean, I think that is uh, a big, really big separate discussion on uh, how we arrive at a certain generalization that's justified. I'm, I was trying to point out that there are different grounds for saying that a generalization is unacceptable. So one of them would be that, well, actually it's not justified. We haven't been able to, it's, if we look at the facts, they don't corroborate. But that's just one way, that's just one, that's a false generalization. That's just one uh, K, one, one ground for uh, dismissing a gen uh, generalization as unacceptable. And my main point here was to say that there are these other uh, grounds as well, and that's important to distinguish them from each other. Okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Christian. It was yeah very interesting, but uh, I was wondering whether it would be good to say at the very beginning that um, there's a basic distinction between, let's say, epistemic mm -hmm. acceptability on the one hand and uh, legal acceptability or legal and moral acceptability on the other because mm. your first example is of course a case of legal uh, excuse me of uh, epistemic unacceptability mm. uh, while the last one the discrimination uh, thing is a case of moral and legal absolutely so maybe it would be good to say that at the very beginning and secondly on the legal uh, acceptability issue i wonder whether you could make a distinction between the use of a generalization in a criminal case against the defendant or in favor of the defendant. That would be, I think, very, very important. Because if you use one of the uh, generalizations that are in the middle, let's say, not the clearly true one nor uh, the, the clearly false one, and you use it, uh, let's say, to generate a reasonable doubt, um, mm. it's one thing. If you want to use the same generaliz generalization against 
uh, the defendant, it's a different story. So, mm. depending on the standard of proof, and the, 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 maybe you can have some difference there. Mm. Uh, yes. Uh, well, first of all, I, I agree completely with this that it's important to point out that some grounds are epistemic and others are ethical. That was my, one of the main points of my paper. I didn't say that initially. That's in the paper initially, but not in my talk. Um, the other point you're raising is, is I think, is very, also very interesting and, and complicated, whether an argument goes in, uh, in favor of a defendant or against the defendant, uh, because, as we all know, uh, from an epistemic point of view, that doesn't make a difference, but from an ethical point of view, it does make a difference, because uh, criminal law, the standard of proof in criminal law, is based on the shared ethnic uh, assumption that some mistakes are, are worse than other mistakes. It's, it's uh, uh, sending an innocent person to prison is a worse mistake than acquitting a guilty person. Um, and that of, uh, and the whole, the, the legal evaluation of evidence in criminal cases has to be, of course, constructed according to, to this uh, ethical principle. Uh, on the other hand, it's important that it's constructed in the right way so that it does not, uh, so we don't end up with double counting. Because if we, if we take account of that, that ethical principle when we set the standard of proof and then also take account of it in how we evaluate evidence, there might be a risk that we are double counting this ethical principle. Uh, I'm not saying that you did, but I think it's, uh, uh, this is a risk that you also have to take into account. Uh, I think, for example, uh, a good example would be the... Um, uh, this situation here, uh, where someone might say, okay, what should be the principle for when a certain generalization should not be used because the decision maker is uh, I incorrectly applying it? If we would only have an epistemic criteria here, you would say, you, would, you could have a principle say, okay, let's minimize the error. If the, if the distance on the left is, is uh, bigger than the distance on the right, then it should be admitted. If it's the other way around, it should be not be admitted. So that we just look at how big the error is. That would be a, like a purely epistemic criteria. Whereas someone would say, well, wait a minute. Well, now we have to take account of the fact that some errors are more important than others, or worse than others. So if, if for example, we'd, we, if, if it would be here that a certain generalization would be uh, negative for the defendant, then you could make the argument that it's inadmissible even if the distance on the right is a little smaller than the distance on the left, because the distance on the right is more ethically important than the distance on, on the left side. And that I don't think would be double counting, because then, you're, then that's inadmissible as evidence, right? I didn't think ab about the double counting uh, issue, so I'm, I don't know, uh, I still have to think about it, but I agree on the last point, you mm -hmm. know, in that case. Yeah. Serena? Okay, um, I am wondering about the distinction about um, unacceptable generalization and generalization unacceptable non-categorically. Mm. And I was wondering if it is possible to say that in a legal context, generalization are unacceptable only uncategorically. And I have two suggestions for uh, this conclusion. The first one is, uh, I think that it is important to uh, um, put, in, put in light that most of uh, generalization depends on institutional limitations. 
I mean, in legal context, most of generalization are found on legal institution. For example, the legal principle of prognosis of culpability. Um, you say most of uh, guilty defendants are common to uh, make uh, commit new crime. But it is a legal principle that the only way to, uh, um, to, to prove it is just uh, considering his criminal story. It's not dependent on moral or something else, but a criminal story. And the criminal story is a generalization, but it is based on a legal principle. I mean, um, legal institutions are a limitation for generalization, first. Secondly, I'm wondering about the context. Uh, generalization in a legal context depend on the way the fact has been reconstructed by the discourse of the parties and so it may be, be, it is connected to a strategic uh, uh, choice um, which is a rhetorical choice and which is in principle acceptable in uh, the legal interaction and according to the due process of law these are my two, two suggestions Mm -hmm. When you're saying that it's that there is this institutional setting, I mean, are you saying that a, the, a generalization could never be categorically unacceptable in the law because legal rules are always defeasible? Is that the argument? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I don't think that legal rules are always defeasible. I mean, most are probably, but I mean, it must be possible for a legal system to a legal system to exist with a rule that is absolute and and which is not defeasible i mean that must be possible That's, we cannot just exclude that uh. I, I was thinking about uh, forced generalization and discriminating generalization in particular and i think that there are a lot of examples which are legal rules uh, could if, which are in legal rule provisions that demonstrate that most of generalization are found on legal principle. Yeah, but not all. I mean, if, if <laughs> uh, so therefore, I mean, the, the argument that uh, categorically unacceptable generalizations cannot exist in the law is, uh, well, I don't think, I, I, I don't agree with you that that's the case. Um, if we look at, I mean, Let's look at, the, at this, the, this U.S. regulation on, in the Federal Rules of Evidence that prior conviction can, uh, is inadmissible as evidence for guilt in the present case. Uh, this rule was amended a couple of years ago. So previous to that amendment, uh, it was... Uh, always inadmissible to use prior conviction in all kinds of cases. And then there, were, there was a series of, in the US of cases of, of child molestation cases uh, where the defendant had been previously convicted of child molestation, uh, where the general public felt that it was uh, strange that this was inadmissible as evidence in the new case. And this led to a change in the federal rules of evidence. So now there is actually uh, an exception to this, to this rule. The rule is not as simple as I stated it before, but the rule actually says that uh, prior conviction is, is, is inadmissible unless, and there are two exceptions, rape cases and child molestation cases. In those two cases, it is admissible, but not in other cases. And I, I think that this story shows very well uh, that you are wrong when you are describing it that this should be some kind of principle that's de defeasible. For it, if you would have been correct, it wouldn't have been necessary to amend the rule. It, the courts could just have said that, well, okay, in general, it's inadmissible, but in child molestation cases, it's well, it's defeasible. So let's make an exception there. But the but. No court did that in the U.S. because they saw this as a categorical rule. It is, prior conviction is unacceptable. That's what the rule says 
full stop. So therefore, it had to be changed, it had to be amended, it, the, it had, the exception had to be spelled out in the rule for, uh, to, to, to change the law. So I do think this shows that it is, that there are cases where, where some generalizations are categorically unacceptable. Gabby? Child molesters, and I remembered. Uh, and what about cases of terrorism or national security in uh, the states, where it is mm. very reasonable to raise a question about the, the religion and prior convictions and things like that? Well, I think that that is exactly the reason why the U.S. government did not want to prosecute uh, Osama bin Laden because they knew that they would get into this kind of problem. So that's why they deliberately choose to, to execute him without a trial. Because they knew that they would always otherwise get into this situation where everyone would say, well, of course, the, the fact, if someone has a track record of being a terrorist, this is some kind of evidence, and, the, and uh, a judge would be in the situation where he or she would need to say, well, wait a minute, we have a federal rule here that says that it's categorically unacceptable. And that would be, I think there are a number of other reasons why a trial against Os Osama bin Laden would have been deeply problematic for the US legal system. Uh, but I think that's one of them. Or one of the reasons why the government didn't want a trial. Or they will introduce another exception to the rule. Yeah, that, that would have been a solution to, uh, to introduce one. But I mean, they hadn't done so, so far, so. Federico? Thank you, Christian. Um, I wonder, I would like to stress out two important points. The first one is, I'm referring particularly to your paper and not also to your presentation. Is it possible to judge for a generalization about uh, its truth value, some generalization seems to be really true, mm. some generalization seems to be really false, some other generalization, mm, we are not so sure we should discuss about this. Mm. And so the question is, you say and you re rewrite in your paper that uh, generalization depends on the empirical correctness. We say that the generalization is true if it is empirically correct. But are we sure that uh, the ground to judge about uh, true or false of a generalization is just empiric? Or maybe we should think to other kind of, other kind of uh, correctness. I, I don't know exactly if I'm able to give you an example, but when you say empirically correct, what really does it mean? Well, that it corresponds to the real world. It corresponds to how, how the world is. I think it's, it's uh, that's, my whole point is that I think it's important to distinguish, like we said with Giovanni before, uh, epistemic arguments from ethical arguments here, because it seems to me that they are often being mixed with each other. That's exactly why, I, and I, that's why I want to speak about unacceptable generalization as the general term, which could cover epistemic problems as well as ethical problems, and then to, to distinguish then the, the problem of true or false from the problem of ethically acceptable uh, on grounds of discrimination, which are two different things. Because as we all know from discrimination law, something could be discriminatory and unacceptable, unlawful, unethical, even if it's not epistemically incorrect. Yeah, but in, in the first example, it's quite clear to me that uh, we refer empirically to the real world, okay, the blue car and so on. But in other examples, we refer to, to the way by which we decide that someone is guilty or not. Uh, I, I know that it's possible to say it is the real world, but maybe it is, there is a distinction between examples for the ground of correctness. It is just my hypothesis. I'm not saying that it is true, but Maybe it's possible to discuss about what does it mean to be empirically correct. It's just a question. Yeah, I think that, as I said earlier, I mean that's okay. a, that's a whole discussion over there. Thanks. Um, 
I, I think we have time for two more questions, one here, and then I'm going to take the last one. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. I guess uh, you really uh, presented the problem uh, in a quite illustrative uh, way. But then uh, what I wonder is, is the impact that these false or unaccepted generalizations have on those who decide cases. You know, whether I know that there have been many studies on, on that impact on juries. But, you know, we know when uh, there are black defendants, though it's more probable uh, they, will, they will find it guilty and, and so on. But uh, I don't know of any studies uh, where there was a comparison made between uh, uh, lay persons who decide juries and judges, professionals, because obviously they are in a different epistemic uh, situation. So. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, the, um, as I said in the beginning, the, the research group that I'm heading in Lund is a group that we're doing like theoretical and empirical stuff and that are connected to each other. So what I presented today, I didn't present any empirical stuff today, but there, we're doing stuff that's related to this. And uh, to give you just a brief example of something that you're asking for, uh, maybe some of you guys, I don't know, you guys were in Lisbon uh, at the ACE, some of you were. Um, Frank Senker had a presentation there, which is, uh, he is in my group, which, uh, I don't know if some of you heard that, which is a study that we made together uh, that uh, we discussed yesterday, where the basic setup was this, uh, that we uh, asked uh, 260, we had uh, judge, 260 judges, about 300 lay people, and uh, we gave them a scenario uh, where uh, a criminal case where uh, an eyewitness is a person who's been previously convicted for uh, arm stealing. That has nothing to do with the present case. He just happened to be at the scene of this crime. He has nothing to do with that. Arm stealing has nothing to do with the case. It's just his background. So the question is now, okay, how does that affect his trustworthiness as, as a witness? And we ask people to assess that, to say, okay, it's, it doesn't affect, okay, or it, it makes him slightly less trustable, trustworthy than people in general, or, much, or clearly less trustworthy, or much less, so forth. Uh, and we did this, uh, and we, what we wanted to see was these, the extreme judgment where someone would say this, is, uh, this makes him uh, more or less completely untrustworthy. It's not just slightly, but it, 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 it strongly uh, decreases his, his, his reliability. And we saw that if we just asked the question like that, about 10% of judges as well as lay people gave that answer. So there wasn't a, a really real difference between judges and lay people that gave the extreme answer, whereas 90% in both cases gave more moderate answers. But then we did another thing. Uh, the, then we had the, the, the participants were actually divided in two groups where we had a second group of people judges as well as lay people, uh, where they got the exact same scenario, but before they answered the same question, they were asked to, to do a little task where we asked them, okay, could you please here write down on a couple of lines the reasons why uh, you would think that being previously convicted of a crime would make you generally less trustworthy than other people? And, and then, would you please state the reasons why this would not be so, the reasons why previous conviction for crime is not relevant for, for your uh, uh, trustworthiness as, as an eyewitness. Uh, and what happened with this, with, the, with this group is that the people who did this task, uh, the 10% of, of, of strong answers went down to zero. It completely took the, the extreme cases off. 
this was a kind of a debiasing thing. We activated their critical thinking on this, and so uh, and that actually worked in in getting these strong prejudices away. And the effect was the same on judges as on lay people. So uh, I think this is the study has many interesting results that debiasing does work. Uh, but also that actually the idea that judges and lay people are so very different here, uh, uh, this study does not confirm that, but, but, but the opposite. And I think that it is also so that, I mean, judges have training in law, but they don't have training in, in uh, non-legal things, and this is a non-legal issue. So, therefore... Uh, it, it's not so strange that they will approach it similarly to lay people. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Let me finish with a comment and a question uh, for myself. And it, it follows nicely uh, this question. Uh, the comment is, uh, so I was trying to think as you work through the cases, and I thought they were great cases um, and very rich. Uh, I was trying to think, uh, what are the ways to respond to unacceptable generalizations? Uh, if you're a defense lawyer, for example, and it seemed that there were three kinds of responses uh, that you mentioned. One, of course, is to show it's a false generalization, uh, as you did in the first case, uh, to, uh, when people assume that if you uh, were found guilty before, then you're more likely to be guilty in the current case. The second way seemed to be to change the reference class. And, and that's fascinating too, uh, you know, so that if it's, uh, it might be true that uh, a certain percent, that Somalis are more likely to commit crimes, but you think of this person as not just a Somali, but a Somali with a family who's got a job, who's got a history of helping in the community. Or in the case of the, the man with the gun, you could do it both with the man. You could also do it with uh, the woman, that she is a woman who is unemployed, has you know, been, had her children taken from her, et cetera. So changing the reference class is another very strong way to deal with it. A third strategy is to say that the generalization is morally unacceptable. And I think it's fascinating to think of it that way. My question is, is there another, are there other ways that are not in, uh, are there other ways to respond to unacceptable generalizations other than those three? First, thank you for summing up so nicely what, what I wanted to say. And uh, 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 not, not that I have found, but I'm not excluding that there could be other, other arguments, that there could, maybe that, it could, that there could be other ethical arguments yeah. than discrimination, for example. But, and yeah. different kinds of moral unacceptability, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay, uh, uh, please join me in thank Kirsten for I thought what was a very thank stimulating you. paper. Thank you. And we now have a coffee break and then we move to room five.